So Millie's school requires all returning students to do summer work. And of course, you know, Millie, Millie doesn't want to think about homework during the summer. I don't blame her. But there's two other people who want to think about homework during the summer even less than Millie. <laughs> Mom and dad. <laughs> uh, I don't even want to think about it. Um, can I get an amen from the parents out there? Homework is the bane of our existence. It's the worst. I can't stand it. But it's even worse during the summer, you know. So, um, of course, this past summer, we waited for the last few days of summer to look at what we needed to complete. <laughs> We're procrastinators, too. Uh, good thing her teacher does not come to church here, okay? Uh, you're always welcome, um, but, you know, you might not come after what I say today. Uh, anyway, uh, to our horror, um, we looked at what she needed to do, and with a few days of summer left, we discovered that one of the summer reading assignments was to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Um, love the book, but no chance she was going to finish reading the book with a few days of summer left. So what did this upstanding, honest, pastor, godly man do? <laughs> hey, Millie, get on Netflix and watch The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. <laughs> and two hours and 23 minutes later... Millie's summer homework was completed. <laughs> it's a really good thing that Millie's teacher doesn't come to school here. Hopefully she already put in the grade for that so we don't get uh, punished. Anyway, uh, in all seriousness, though, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, one of my favorite stories of all time. Um, if you know, if, you, if you've read it or seen the movie, if you're a movie person, the movie's good too. But um, in the story, Aslan, the lion, he's the lion, his name's Aslan, at one big moment in the story, he sacrifices himself to pay the debt of a boy named Edmund, who was indebted to the White Witch. And though Aslan did nothing wrong, he loved Edmund so much that he was humiliated, he was tortured, and he was killed on Edmund's behalf. And so Aslan is killed on what was called the stone table, but then raises again to life. Sound familiar, right? Um, and after he comes back to life, two other characters in the story, two of the other children, Susan and Lucy, they see Aslan and ask if he's a ghost. But he breathes on them to show them that he is actually real and then explains how he was raised. And listen to this. This is what he said. It means that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still, which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time, but she could have looked, if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. Mm, I love it. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Y'all ready for a new series? All right. Uh, so this is part one of our brand new series in Daniel called Living with the Lions. I gotta, that's like the coolest graphic we've ever come up with. I think we actually pulled it from another church, but <laughs> thanks, whoever you are. That's really good. It was our title, though. Okay, so anyway, um, living with the lions, and the message for today is called The Deeper Magic. The Deeper Magic. So let's go ahead. Let's just start right into Daniel chapter 1. Let's, uh, let's read it. Verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you know, I like preaching from the Old Testament, but... The names drive me insane. So I, you know, I'm just going to confidently pronounce it, but I have really have no idea how to pronounce most of the names. So it's in Hebrew, a lot of it. So anyway, okay. Anyway, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. 
Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, used without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So the book of Daniel overall, it tells the story of a group of Jews who were exiled from their home country of Israel to a place called Babylon. So before we go any further, let's first understand what actually led to this group of Jews being exiled to Babylon. So we have to go all the way back at the, at the beginning of Israel's history as a nation. God made a covenant with them, which was called the Old Covenant. And when God made this covenant with Israel, it was predicated on, here you go, Israel received God's favor for their obedience and received God's disfavor for their disobedience. And God spelled all of this out for them in Leviticus chapter 26. Now, I won't read all of Leviticus 26. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, it's good, but read it on your own. Um, but here are some highlights, okay, of what God said all the way back in, the, in, in Leviticus of what would happen to Israel if they disobeyed. He said this. Their crops would be ruined. They would be prey for wild animals and their enemies. They would be scattered among the nations and would waste away in exile. That's what God said in Leviticus 26. So if you've read the Old Testament, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but much of what happens to God's people in the Old Testament and what we'll read about today, I mean, let's be honest, most of it seems cruel. It does. But we have to remember when we're reading this, what happened to God's people in the Old Testament was a result of their own disobedience, okay? Under the Old Covenant, it was a different covenant. Under the Old Covenant, all of the disfavor that God's people experienced could have been avoided if they would have obeyed. If they would have obeyed, what would they have received? They would have received God's favor, but if they, but they did not obey, that's a theme throughout the, all the Old Testament, the people did not obey, and so they received God's disfavor. And we have to remember, those were the terms of the covenant that they lived under, okay? And important quick side note, we'll get back to this, but because of Jesus, we're not under the Old Covenant anymore. That's really good news, and this all should make us feel even more thankful for the blood of Jesus that we're not held to the standards of the Old Covenant anymore. Our relationship with God doesn't work like that anymore. In Romans, Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So more on that later. But um, now that we know the context of Leviticus 26, what the terms of the covenant was, let's see specifically how this group of Jews, including Daniel and his friends, ended up in Babylon. The story, their story, actually begins in 2 Kings 20. So flip, flip back if you have your Bible. 2 Kings 20, many years before Daniel, with a king named Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Probably the most famous story about Hezekiah, really cool story, um, in 2 Kings 20, he was going to die. He got sick. He was going to die. He, but then he prayed to God that um, God would spare his life. And God heard his prayer and extended his life 15 years. Now I was thinking about this, you know, this sounds pretty good, but on the same time then you like really know when you're going to die, so I don't know. But uh, anyway, I thought it was a cool story. Extended his life 15 years. So Hezekiah was the king of Judah. So at this point, a lot, of, a little bit of history today, okay, but um, at this point, Judah was called the southern kingdom because Israel at this moment was divided and split into two kingdoms, the north 
in the south. So Hezekiah was king of the southern kingdom, otherwise known as Judah. And everything that's written about Hezekiah um, says that he was a great king and a great man. Look at 2 Kings 18. It says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. So Hezekiah was a model of faithfulness and obedience. He really was. And I read that and I thought, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't we all kind of like to have something like that written about us? You know, like uh, Tyler trusted in the Lord. He was so faithful and obedient that there was none like him among all the pastors after him, <laughs> nor among all those who were before him. What a, what a great thing to have written, you know, wow. Now, to be clear, uh, wanting to be faithful and obedient to God is a good thing. But listen to me, it can also be a very dangerous thing because sin lurks in our goodness more deceptively than it does in our badness. Sin lurks in our goodness more deceptively than it does in our badness. Look what happens to faithful and obedient Hezekiah in verse 12. At that time, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah welcomed them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all the realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So, I mean, what, what in the world happened here? I mean, the king of Babylon sends a get well soon card and a get well soon present to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah looks like he's just being a nice guy. He's like, hey, man, thanks for coming to see me. You want to see my house? You know, let's walk around. And he's showing him his like 80 inch TV in the basement. And he's showing him like all of his treasure trove of really cool stuff. Like, man, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Yeah, all of his sneakers. You know, it's, it's really cool. Like, there's my Air Jordans, you know, whatever. He's showing him all of this stuff. And at first, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. I mean, come on, let's be honest. I mean, one's just showing him around. What's, what's the issue with it? But here's the issue. By showing, especially in the context of those days, by showing the king of Babylon his treasure house, Hezekiah was making Babylon his ally. He was aligning himself, his nation, with Babylon instead of trusting in the Lord to protect his kingdom. What Hezekiah did was he put his trust in political alliances. That's what he did. Now that's another whole message that uh, we're not gonna tackle yet today. <laughs> but I do think it is relevant, especially for the time of year that we're in. Trust not in chariots and horses. Trust not in a man, but trust in the Lord. So, but let's be honest with this situation that we're looking in right now. It doesn't seem fair. 
It doesn't seem fair. I mean, Hezekiah, I mean, everything that's written about him. He's a faithful and obedient king. He's a great king. But then his whole life, I mean, his whole life, he's just faithful. And then he, he's just with this one little slip up. And it wasn't even, you know, in comparison to what other kings did in the past. It wasn't that big of a deal. He showed his king around. He's just doing the best to protect his nation. But, but then God swoops in, and now all of a sudden, the Babylonians would one day come carry off everything in his palace including his own sons ouch I mean that's brutal Amen. but remember the whole premise of the old covenant was favor for obedience and disfavor for disobedience and the bottom line is however much we, on the scale of disobedience we want to label it Hezekiah disobeyed God he did and so he received God's disfavor. And church, what happened to Hezekiah should show us the standards of the old covenant and the standard of the law. The standard of the law is not try your best and God will do the rest. That ain't the standard of the law. Here's the standard of the law. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's the standard of the law. So as faithful and obedient Hezekiah may have been, he was very faithful and very obedient according to all that was written. Here's the bottom line. He still failed and he fell short as we all do under the law. No matter how good you think you've been, no matter how faithful and obedient you think you are, you fall way short under the weight and the standards of God's law. That's what the story of Hezekiah showed us. And so many years later, Babylon indeed, they came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Look at 2 Kings 24. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him, and the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the Amorites, and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. There it all happens. So this, what I just read, this is the event that was referenced in Daniel chapter 1, where we started out that it says in Daniel 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. This moment in history is actually when Daniel and his friends get taken away to Babylon, okay? And we're going to talk a lot about Daniel during the series, but as for today, I actually want to talk about what happens to Judah, the southern kingdom, after Daniel and his friends get um, exiled to Babylon. So though they're carried off to Babylon at this point, the kingdom of Judah hadn't yet totally surrendered to Babylon. But that would only come less than a, less than a year later under the next king named Jehoiakim. I mean, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. Kin, Okay, it's a, it's a little difference. But um, let's look at 2 Kings 24, verse 10. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. This is the surrender. Himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials, the king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, has made as the Lord foretold. Okay? Now, you might be asking, why in the world does all of this matter? Well, it matters a lot. And it matters a lot because of the promise that God made to King David. Okay, stay with me here. God made a promise to David, and look what he promised in 2 Samuel 7, 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's the promise he gave to David. 
But in 2 Kings 24, as we just read with King Jehoiakim, David's kingdom, David's throne, his kingly line is destroyed. Everything's carried away. There is no more king. So look what God speaks to Jehoiakim through the prophet Jeremiah. This is, this is King uh, Jehoiakim. Look at, look at what he says. As surely as I live, says the Lord, I will abandon you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Even if you were the signet ring on my right hand, I would pull you off. I will hand you over to those who seek to kill you, those you so desperately fear, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the mighty Babylonian army. I will expel you and your mother from this land, and you will die in a foreign country, not in your native land. You will never again return to the land you yearn for. Why is this man Jehoiakim like the discarded broken jar? Why are he and his children to be exiled to a foreign land? O oh, earth, 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 listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Let the record show that this man Jehoiakim was childless he is a failure for none of his children will succeed him on the throne of David to rule over Judah ouch everything is destroyed because Jehoiakim failed he is a failure God said let the record show he is a failure have you ever felt like that have you ever been in this place before facing the haunting realities of your own failures and mistakes or picking up the pieces of your shattered dreams, wondering if God has abandoned you constantly, constantly having to live in the shadow of your own guilt and your shame and your own regret. Have you ever been to this place? He is a failure. You are a failure. See, I, I believe at one point or another, we all end up in that place. We all end up in that place because listen to me, just like Hezekiah, no matter how faithful and obedient we may think we are or try to be, no matter how hard, we will always run up against the harsh reality that we have all failed and we have all fallen way short of the glory of God. Every single one of us in this room. It's what Romans chapter three tells us. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Christians that obs obsess over the law, I don't understand. I, I don't understand it because here's the reality. When you live your life under that law, trying to fulfill its, its demands and trying to live in your own obedience and your own faithfulness, the law, the old covenant, it has the same words to us as it did to King Jehoiakim. Here's what the law tells us. You are a failure. You're a failure. And so we all in some way, at some point, must face that reality that we're all failures because we could never live up to the demands of what God requires of us. And we all have to live in the shadow of the guilt and the shame and the regret that our failure has caused. I want to share this post with you, this uh, blog from my friend Tully and Chavijan. This is what it says. Perhaps you too have failed miserably and people that you dearly love have been deeply damaged. Maybe you committed adultery. Maybe you're an addict to alcohol, porn, drugs, shopping, food. Maybe your kids have gone off the deep end and you blame yourself for leaving their father years ago and breaking up your home. Maybe you've been an emotional or physical abuser. Maybe you've been so wrapped up in the work you do that you're just now realizing that you've lost years with your now adult children. Maybe it's a lifetime of pushing people away because you're combative and critical and always have to be right. Whatever it is for you, if you struggle with guilt and shame and regret from the pain you have caused people that you love, then you know an inescapable throbbing. 
You may be doing something fun or productive and out of nowhere, like a tidal wave of raw emotion, it hits you. And you are transported right back to the unavoidable reality that your sin and selfishness have decimated someone else. Someone that you love and someone that loves you. What I've discovered is this. The grace of God gives you the freedom and space to feel what you're feeling rather than to deny it. To face the tormenting reality of what you've done rather than running from it. It gives you permission not to stuff it, but to be real about it. To recognize it rather than to resist it. The hope of the Christian faith is not that we will in this life get past our guilt, shame, and regret. Rather, it is that God promises to be with us when we struggle with our guilt, shame, and regret. So when you find yourself plagued and paralyzed by the pain that you've caused, the gospel is there to remind you 77 times that there is a deeper magic behind the curtain of your faults. Behind that accusing internal voice that whispers, look at what you have done, is the absolving external voice that shouts, look at what I have done. Amen. 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 The cross of Jesus is always and forever there to repeat over and over to our forgetful and unbelieving hearts that God meets our guilt with his grace, our shame with his salvation, and our regret with redemption. See, today I told you this specific history lesson of, of, of disobedience and failures of a long line of people. And really it's the story of the whole Old Testament, but today we just focused on Israel and Judah and King Hezekiah and Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. But do you know that in, uh, behind the curtain of that story, there's another version of the story that was working itself out behind that curtain the whole time. It's called the deeper magic that goes all the way back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned. And here, church, is the deeper magic version of the story that I just told you. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers born at the time of exile to Babylon. And after, oh, your failure, it's just the beginning of God doing something brand new. Because after the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abiad. Abiad was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliad. Eliad was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Matan. Matan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who's called the Messiah. Woo! That's the deeper magic that operates in the background of your failure, the background of your guilt and shame and regret. There is a greater purpose that God has for you, even in your greatest of failures. God is there working his magic. And you want to know what the magic is called? Grace. Grace. God's grace amidst all the failures and disobedience and unfaithfulness of God's people. God is still working out his plan. Mm. And I want to tell you today, behind the curtain of every single one of your failures, there is always a deeper magic at work. Always. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's the deeper magic 
that is always working in the lives of believers. Romans 8, 28, that's the deeper magic right there. See, in, in our story today, I mean, look, it certainly seemed like the failures of God's people were too great, right? I mean, I mean, let's get back to this. Remember, because of Jehoiakim's disobedience and failures, God said, he told him, none of his children will succeed him on the throne of David to rule over Judah. None. Well, so was his failure too great? I mean, did it cancel the promises of God? God promised David that your throne will be established forever. But did the failures of God's people, you know, absolve the promise of God? Did it cancel the promise of God? The promise that God made to David that the Messiah, Jesus, would come from his line. Look at it again, 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house, your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's what God promised David. But Jehoiakim failed. So now how could the Messiah, how could Jesus of the line of David and Jehoiakim, how could Jesus fulfill God's promise that David's descendants would rule forever if David and Jehoiakim's descendants which, as you just said, includes Jesus, we're now barred from the throne. How, how is this going to work? In other words, listen to me, if Jehoiakim's failures ended David's kingly line and prevented his descendants from rolling on David's throne, then how could Jesus of the line of David come to rule as the king? Did you catch it? Look at Matthew 1.16. Here's how. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary Amen. gave birth Amen. to Jesus, Amen. who is called the Messiah. So listen to me. Legally, Jesus is a descendant of David and Hezekiah and Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim and all of that long list of failures. Legally, he is a descendant of all of it. But, oh, Biologically, though, he was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born without sin. Yeah. He reversed the curse because he was born without sin. So that means that all of Jehoiakim's failures did not pass to Jesus because of Jesus' miraculous birth. So church, Jesus is our Messiah of the line of David, of the line of Jehoiakim, came to deliver us from all of our sins and came to deliver us from all of our failures. This is the gospel that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the deeper magic that's always been at work behind the curtain of our failures. That's the gospel. And listen to me, God, if, if, if this message doesn't tell you anything else, this is what I want you to get from it. God will stop at nothing to forgive us of our failures, to cover our shame, to redeem our regret, and always, always, 70 times, seven forever, always meet us with his grace. Every single time. Always. See, under the old covenant, under the law, if the people of Israel obeyed, they experienced favor. But if they disobeyed, they would experience God's disfavor. But now, church, there is a deeper magic that is working behind the scenes. And the, the, the deeper magic is a new covenant, the new covenant that's called grace, that isn't reliant at all on our obedience. It's not reliant at all on our obedience or our faithfulness. It's not reliant at all on that, but it's reliant totally on the obedience of Jesus on our behalf. He came to fulfill the law, every dot, every iota, and then give that righteousness to us. That's the hope of the new covenant of grace, and that's the deeper magic. 
See, the old covenant, the law, says good people get good stuff and bad people get bad stuff. But the new covenant, grace, says the bad get the best. And the worst inherit the wealth. And the slave becomes a son. Now that's the deeper magic that's always at work behind the curtain of all of our failures and mistakes. Always. See, behind that accusing internal voice that whispers, look at what you have done, is the absolving external voice that shouts, look, look at what I have done. The cross of Jesus is always and forever there to repeat over and over to our forgetful and unbelieving hearts that God meets with our guilt, meets our guilt with his grace, our shame with his salvation, and our regret with his redemption. That is the deeper magic.